Aaron Whitlow. Brandon Spiley. And we are the Mark Out Movie Podcasters. And in today's episode, we have a very special guest. We have Ken Sagos from Nightmare on M Street 3 and 4 and should have been the rest of them, to be real with you. And uh, and uh, he's also uh, been in uh, Hard Lessons, Rosewood, and also he's written several things. And he has a new movie, uh, McHenry Trial, that is going to be a fantastic thing to see. Ken, how are you doing today? I'm doing well. So let me correct you. It's, it's a short film that I'm hoping to parlay into a feature film. So that's why I'm appearing to you all to help me get the likes and the um, comments on YouTube so I can make this go viral so we can get a proud movie. I agree. And I hope that we accomplish that. Uh, and hopefully you accomplish it because you did all the work. I'm just here just being a, a mouthpiece for it. I, I love the trailer. Brandon saw the trailer as well. So, Yeah, I, I thought it was really good. I didn't realize it was a short film, though. It's a short, fi it's a short film that, you know, uh, everybody thinks it's a, it's a big film, but it's not. I'm trying to get it to be a big film. So how I can do that, if I can get people to – uh, say they like it and investors see it and I've been getting some good response and it's been um, I've been um, invited by over 350 um, film festivals across the world so it's getting some attention and and, um, and it's fresh it's new it's something that we haven't seen before and that's hard to do that is hard to do I agree amen well we're uh... I'm going to start with a question to you. Um, well, Brandon has the first question about kind of like what made you get into – Brandon, ask your question. I'm asking your question for you. Hey, I was just wondering, uh, you came – you were born in uh, Atlanta, Georgia. Is that correct? I was born in Stockbridge, Georgia, Stockbridge, which okay. south of Atlanta. I was wondering, uh, like at what age did you know you wanted to be an actor? Well, my mama said I came out acting, so <laughs> – <laughs> So eventually she said, well, if you're going to act a fool, why not make some money off of it? So yeah. I've, uh, I've always enjoyed training people, uh, you know, um, not, not just training people, but making people, entertaining people. And I remember when I was a little kid, about eight years old, I was acting, doing something. And my sister said, y'all going to watch uh, school to crack jokes today. That's that's why if you see the short, you see me driving by on a scooter. Yeah. That's me giving homage to my nickname, which was Scooter. So that's why that's there. But I uh, I was in my first play when I was seven years old. Wow. That's awesome, man. Uh, I, this is awesome. But I wrote first little short story when i was six that's impressive that is impressive man, i think I, I couldn't write my abc's right at six man. <laughs> <laughs> i've never passed the english class <laughs> i won't i won't say a word uh, but that's that's impressive um i wanted to know about like the atmosphere around the time that you like popped up on the scene i i in the 80s, I would say. Um, maybe it's prior to that. And if, I, if, I, if it's prior, I apologize. But in the 80s, I know that like people like Robert Townsend had that movie Hollywood Shuffle, yeah. and which is a, a satire about what it was like being um, African-American in the 80s trying to vie for a film rose. And back then they said, like in that movie, it shows you had to either be a pimp or you had to be a, a thug or you had to be slave they had that like black acting school skit in there in the middle of it and i was wondering if there's any truth to uh the the culture at that time for black um actors oh i mean is, is, is this true oh god yes i mean and robert i don't to this day i don't think people realize how powerful uh robert townsend's movie was and because it represented so much about how we was being treated in Hollywood and how Hollywood treated 
us as a people before the 80s. Now, also, let's just say not just people in Hollywood, but people all over the world, how they treated us. And so Robert Townsend was just a brilliant enough artist to know how to make money off of it. You know, Robert Townsend, you know, he was the, the first, you know, uh, gorilla shooting, you know, he'd go in and shoot something for the, the police get there saying you can't do that and they shot it and gone. And if you, you know, to go behind the scene, there was a lot of unity because I wasn't in the film, but I knew a lot of friends in the film. And the unity was, is that they know that we're going to shoot on this corner. We're not supposed to shoot on this corner. So they knew that they would go there, do it and leave. And so they gave you your best. In order to do that, it had to be a united front and everyone had to be together. There wasn't no pulling this and pulling this. And they was a great band and Robert was a great band leader. Amen. That's good. I like, I'm a big fan of, uh, of Hollywood Shuffle. It's like one of my favorite films. Yeah. I thought that uh, it just displayed just what it was like. Because uh, he had one part of the movie, and I ain't going to uh, stay on that too long, but he had one part of the movie where like he had that dream about they wanted the next Eddie Murphy. And so that's all that people started trying to be was like another Eddie Murphy. And uh, he was saying that, you know, I want to be me. I want to be, I don't want to play to the stereotype, but back then, um, especially like in horror, I know that, you know, blacks, we only had certain roles that they were allowing us to have, which is uh, mentioned in the uh, horror noir uh, documentary. Which is true. And before Eddie Murphy, there was uh, Richard Pryor. Everybody wants to be Richard Pryor. And, you know, so um, it's everybody want to be, we could only have one. So we want to be like that one person that was a success and everything. So that's the way they looked at us. And they still look at us that way, even though we're having a wonderful time now. I think the masses of them is still having a hard time that accepting that we are here. We're here to stay, you know. Amen. Randy, you got a question? Yeah, I was I had a question. Um uh, you worked with Denzel Washington and George McKenna's story. What was that experience like for you? Being so young in the business? Scared. I I was truly scared to be on this set with Denzel Washington. I, and it wasn't that he was a bad person. It was just that I'm on this set with someone who I saw as great and someone that I admired and someone who was an inspiration to all of us young men there because Denzel, in my eyes, was a man that represented everything that we saw in a man, man, man. He had that walk, he had that look, he had that style, he was articulate. So I remember during my first scene with him, I was just scared. And I don't think I performed as good as I could have. It was just a learning process, and I was grateful. I was yeah. honored, and I still am. But every time I see that, um, it's hard times. And but when we when we were filming, it was called the George McKenna story. Yeah. So every time I see it, I, I think about that time. I really do. Uh, in that movie, the, uh, kind of piggyback off of what he said. Not only did you work with Denzel in the movie, you worked directly with Earl Billings as your father. Uh, what was that experience like? Because he's like a, a legendary uh, character actor in the business. So, Earl Billings to this day is like my father. I have an organization called the Giving Back Corporation. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And um, where I give kids, young people scholarships and I put supplies in the US classrooms or schools and every year every year um, um, he's right there for me Earl Billings is right there 
he supports me. Even when he can't show his presence, he makes sure that he sends something to help me along the way. And it's truthful to say that Earl Billings is, um, he's very much, he was my father in the Georgia McKenna story, and he's been like my father in this industry. Him and others, but he has been really there for me. And he's a man that have not, he has not got the attention that he deserves in Hollywood. I agree. Brandon? Uh, yeah, I was, um, I was wondering, um, what is, and everyone knows you as uh, Kincaid. Uh, what does that character mean to you? I did not know what Ken K meant, and this is the truth, until maybe a couple of years ago that Ken K represented something. Now, I knew when I, after we filmed it and the attention that I was getting that he represented something. I don't think the production company or anyone knew what they was doing and what they had done when they allowed me to live in that film. And just the other day, they was telling me why they felt that Ken Cade was so important. And I see it now. I didn't see it then. I believe that he was important because he, but yet strength. He wasn't afraid. When he was pushed into a corner, he fought back. He fought back physically, and he could fight back with his mouth. And so, yes, he did. Yeah, yes, he equal, did. equal amount of worries with Freddie, like Freddie had. And, you know, and plus he lived. <laughs> so, yeah. That's um, that's major for us. We yes. didn't get many of them. <laughs> it was major. You know, I, I, I'm 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 really the first African American to survive a major horror film and return to a sequel. So that's in the history books. However, I say this all the time. I have to give homage to the great black actor, Mr. William Marshall, who did a role called Blackula back in the day in the 70s, and there was a sequel. And I had the honor of meeting him. And he was truly, truly a legend. That's awesome. You got to meet Blackula. He also was in, uh, he's also in the, uh, essentially, it's the Black Exorcist film. Uh, yeah. It's a, a black exploitation film. Um, but uh, yeah, that's it's amazing that you got to meet him. Also in um, in that in Nightmare on M Street three, you got to be with uh, Patricia Arquette and uh, Lawrence Fishburne, fresh off of Pee Wee's Play uh, Pee Wee's Playhouse. So, <laughs> but well, you, bring, uh, you know, you bring up some good questions because I have a story for all of them. And Lawrence Fishburne, who I was doing an interview yesterday, and. I always credit Lawrence, Lawrence Fishburne being the person who taught me how to do physical acting. You know, it was Lawrence Fishburne. And he, he was kind of like a big brother on the set and he watched out for me and he, and he taught me a few things that may have been simple to him, but they was big things to me, something that I have carried to this day because Lawrence Fishburne was determined when I was in his company that I was not going to embarrass myself or embarrass my race or embarrass me as a black man. And I, I truly appreciated that. He's one of my favorite uh, actors of all time. His, his role is Furious Styles. In, uh, Boys in the Hood. John Singleton was, was one of my favorite directors of all oh, time. Oh, man, John Singleton. You know, as we talk here, you know, I realize I've been honored. I've worked with some great people. I, I, I've had, I've been blessed. I, I, and I'm just, I'm realizing that now. You know, you knew it, but I'm, re I'm feeling it now. I'm feeling it. So thank you. Oh, no problem. 
Uh, I was just wondering, when you went to audition for Kincaid, what was that, <laughs> that process like? Did you know how big Freddie was at that time? I had never watched a Nightmare on Elm Street film. I didn't even know what Nightmare on Elm Street was. And um, I don't know if you've heard the story, but you know, I, I didn't want to go to the audition. I had an attitude. I was pissed off. I didn't have transportation. I had gotten a ticket. I had to go to court. It was pouring down rain and my agent was sending me there and he read the breakdowns and that the breakdown is a description of what the casting directors are looking for in this role. And what he read to me was a muscular bodybuilder slim guy. And that was not me. That was my thigh size. So <laughs> I didn't want to go, it was a waste of my time. But I agreed to go, it was raining. So I was just wanted to go over there, do the audition and get back on the bus and go home. So when I got there with these, all these guys that were waiting, they was running behind and I had such an attitude. So when I went into the audition, I had an attitude and I, I didn't want to be there. And they knew I didn't want to be there. And so he told me to do some things and I cussed him out, I, you know, be natural. But turned out that was the character they were looking for. Secretly, I guess they thought I was acting. I want to be there. He was upset, I thought. He said, first thing he said was, what did you do? And I said, well, I told you I didn't want to go. And he said, they loved you. So, that's all that's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. I'm glad, I'm glad that uh, we all joy, join into that. Because uh, for me, I can only speak for myself as a uh, kid in the 80s, watching uh, that movie and seeing you. Uh, you actually look like people that I grew up around down the street, like the older kids and things like that. Uh, and so it just like resonated with me. And so for you to, to live and actually, I would say that your character never at any time really showed true fear of Freddie that you actually confronted him. And, uh, and so for that, I'm just honored that um, you, you, you're the first guy that in the films that we can look up to, to be like, like other, well, not the first, cause you know, we all, we had uh we had uh, from Nightmare, Night, Night of Living Dead, you know, we had, we had people, but, but for my generation growing up, I thank you for uh, what you contributed. They didn't live at the end of the movie. No, no, he didn't. Unfortunately, he didn't. And, but that's, that was, I think that was part of George Romero's uh, message too, uh, with that one, which I love the documentary Horror and Noir because it totally, uh, I've watched that documentary like four or five times. You can ask Brandon. <laughs> you know? Yes, he has. He's told me about it. <laughs> but um, I was going to ask you uh, about your uh, role because we talked about uh, John Singleton. So you was in Rosewood. Uh, I was going to ask you. Uh, you was in that movie with some people like Bing Range. There's uh, Don Cheadle. He was in that movie. Several other people. But uh, one of my, one of the people that was that stood out to me when I watched that movie initially back in the day was Esther Rowe. And uh, how was it to kind of be in a film with Esther Rowe? Did you get to spend any time with her on set? Yeah, I, I got to spend some time with her. I, I have this, this thing where I appreciate my elders. I'm not saying other people don't, I'm just saying how I appreciate them. And when I first saw Miss Esther Rowe, she was in the lobby of the hotel. And I introduced myself. And from that moment on, while we was on the set, she took me on her wings. She told me some things. She talked about some things. And um, she encouraged me to keep writing. At that time, I had written, um, this movie won the uh, K-Base, which is an Emmy for On Promised Land, and I let her see it. And I finished my work 
before her. And so, no, she finished before me. And so she couldn't find me. And she wanted to say goodbye. So she wrote me a note on a brown paper bag. And it was one of the most touching notes that I could ever rem remember. And I can't find it. And I, you know, at that time, I didn't know how valuable it was to me. When she took time out that she was determined to let me know that I was going to be okay. And it was important because she said, you hang in there, you're going to be okay. And that meant a lot to me to say that. So the great Miss Esther Rowe, there was the great Mr. Paul Benjamin that was in there. Um, Vin Rang and Don Cheetah, who was a force to work with. But then John Singleton was, I want to say like a big brother, but I'm older than him. So, <laughs> so, but he was certainly someone that passed the knowledge on me to hang in there. Actually, John Singleton loved this uh, script, the McHenry trial. And I spoke to him you know, a couple of years ago in the gym, and he was very interested in it, you know, and I think he would be very proud as to where I am with it now because he gave me some directions about directing, about things to do when I am behind the director's chair or, on, or in the director's chair. He gave me the talk before he made his transition, and um, I appreciate that. I really do appreciate it. Amen. I actually I had a question about the McHenry trial. Um, how did you come up with that story? Um, truthfully speaking, I, I think it's been dangling around in my mind for years. And I just remember as a kid one time and me and a friend, um, we was over to his house playing. This was in the country. And he had a younger brother. And it was television. It was old black and white TV. And he wanted to watch TV. And his, the mother and dad told him it was time to go to bed. He was supposed to watch an hour of children TV. And he presented his case that there was 18 minutes of commercials and those commercials was about adults. So he didn't get the full one hour of time to watch TV and he felt that he was entitled to extra time to take away from that 18 minutes. And they was like, couldn't say nothing. And I said, wow. And so when he left the room, they said, he gonna be an attorney. And I said, wow, and I, that just stuck with me. And I said, wow. Uh, and then years later, there was a show on called Dookie Hauser. I don't know if you remember it. Yeah, and I remember. So I wanted to write something like that. And you know, it, it, I had the hardest time trying to get people to believe in that story. So I said, if I want to show them how it is, do it yourself. And so now it looks good. And the young man is 20, but he's going to be, he's going to be a force to reckon with in the acting entertainment world. So. I had uh, questions actually about the McHenry uh, trial as well. Um, the uh, young, the young guy that you have in that movie, uh, how did you, uh, were you the first one to really discover him or was he like in things beforehand, but what made him <laughs> stick out to you? I think he had, he's been in a couple of small things before, but this is by far his biggest role, the one where he had some meat in it, you know. Um, but I hired a wonderful casting director um, um, that came in, her name was Janine. Um, she brought in some actors, and he was the smallest one. And it was something about his vulnerability. And I knew even though he was the smallest one, it was something about his vulnerability. There was also something about his strength. 
and he also reminded me of myself. And I wanted to work with him, and I, I didn't want to give up on him. And the day that he came to shoot the scene, the first scene that we shot was with Loretta Devine. And that was the first day that they met. And you, you, you don't get any better than working with Loretta Divine. You really don't. <laughs> you at the peak and that mountain with the snow on it, you at the top of that snow. But I thought he was gonna be nervous. Nah, he brought on his little kid game. And I knew I had something there. Um. With that, real quick, I apologize, Brandon, but uh, with that, so do you feel that he, uh, that was like for him, his, uh, like the way you met Denzel and worked with Denzel was him working with Loretta, like that type of, because Loretta Devine, like you said, she's been in the game for some years and she always brings her A game and everything. She feels like my aunt and she's not my aunt, but she feels like my aunt. She feels like the lady that you can go to her house and she have a meal prepared and you can tell her and anything and she'll be there and just and she'll pray for you. That's what she feels like. So, and then after you eat, she's gonna make you wash your own dishes. <laughs> you're not gonna leave her house dirty, mm -mm. and if something out of place, you're not coming back. So. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Um. I don't know because I haven't talked to him. I don't know if he has uh, seen the, the line of the list of actors that I saw as a kid. See, him growing up and him seeing the actors, I guess it's reachable for him. When I was growing up, it, it wasn't reachable for those type of roles. The type of roles that I they said I have to read for as a pimp and negative, a slave, or, or you know, someone doing illegal stuff. But he didn't have to, he doesn't have to reach that. So I don't know. Um, it's different from working. Denzel was, the presence of Denzel was, for me, was like the presence of Sidney Poitier. Yeah. So um, I don't know what his presence is. I can say the presence of Loretta coming to do this scene for me was like asking Zeus's wife to come do this scene for me. Amen. Because I thought she's up there and she's a friend. Most importantly, she's a friend, a true friend. I love Loretta. I love the I love Loretta Devine. Like like that's no joke. She's like I'm a huge fan of hers. Brandon, I'm sorry to cut you off. <laughs> it's all right. It's all right. I was wondering, uh, what is the biggest challenge for you from going from actor to di to director? Uh, the biggest challenge is that nobody want to believe that you can do it. Nobody want to believe that you can make it. Yeah. Um, uh, and all this. Stuff. So I think that's been the challenge in me making sure that I can believe in myself the way the way that some of those, like the Miss Esther Rose, like the Mr. Cambridge, like, you know, the John Singleton believe in me, like the Low I like think the the people that believed in me because sometimes it was difficult to that I can do it until I'm at the moment to do it. Yeah. I'll tell you. I can talk my shit or I can do that, I can do this here, but when you're there, that's another hurdle that I have to jump over. Yeah. And uh, preparing for this, I, I realized that you actually wrote some uh, some award-winning episodes of Laverne and Shirley, too. Uh, so with working with Penny Marshall, because she was like a, 
you do realize you're telling my age now, right? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I like Penny Marshall too. <laughs> God, God rest her soul. Uh, but uh, so, how was that like? Because that was especially like that was in the '80s, man. So that's like revolutionary too, for for you to like. There's not many of us that were able to really take that type of role in in in, in doing something like that. How was that? I, first of all, I started off as a staff writer, as an apprentice writer at Paramount, and it was at a very difficult time in the entertainment industry. It was, I was a young black man that happened to get a job when the writers was on strike. So I literally had to almost walk through the picket lines to every morning. And so I learned a lot. There I was able to work on the, the great um, um, Joseph Berg, um, Milk Josenberg. Now, who is he? He was one of the creators of the Lucille Ball show. He was one of the, who worked on the Andy Griffin show. He hung out with Sheldon Leonard, the one who created I Dream of Jeannie. So these were the people that now I'm in the company with that's passing some knowledge down to me. And um, I had to see it from a different eye, from different eyes and look at it from different eyes. I, I, I do know that the reason that I had that job was because of two black women, two black women, and they fought for me. Um, uh, Ruth Green, and I forgot the other one they uh, in a, in a way, they fought for me and they made sure that I got that job. And at that time, I had an agent that didn't want me to take that job. Mm -hmm. They wanted me to stay into acting, not into writing. Now, and I can't help Gary Marshall, how can you not bring him up? You know, because an hour, I hung up on him, by the way. You say you hung up on him? Gary Marshall. Uh, because, you know, about an, a year prior to that, you know, I'm coming home from school, you know, and you're watching Laverne and Shirley and Happy Days on television. So here it is a year, maybe two years later, you know, um, Gary Marshall had saw a scene that I had written in a showcase, a comedy scene. And so this lady had found me up, located me, called my agent. And so Gary Marshall called me. And so I picked, I, I was working at Universal Studios from 12 to eight. And so when I get home at nine o'clock, I go to sleep. And so it was about nine something, I get this call and I pick up and they said, uh, is this Ken Sago? I said, yes. And they said, can you hold for, please for Gary Marshall? And I said, yeah. And so I, he answered the phone and I said, Gary Marshall, right? Yeah. So I thought it was some of my friends in a matter messing with me saying this was Gary Marshall. So I said, well, hold on, Gary. Can you just hold on for a minute? He said, yeah. And I hung up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Oh, poor, poor Gary. But, no, uh, he called back. We, we laughed about it. We laughed about it. Um, you know, they were hung up on me. I know that uh, back then, and I, I, I give it to Brandon next, but um, I know that back then, like, it was important for, like, Blacks to be writing and things like that. So uh, I know that Marla Gibbs uh, from the Jefferson, she was actually in the writing room to make sure that, like, to let them know, no, we don't do this or we don't do that, you know, to kind of make sure that we are portrayed accurately. and. I parlay that to uh, the McHenry trial because you. Another mother of mine. <laughs> Another mother of yours? Another mother of mine. And by the way, speaking of Miss Marla Gibbs, um, next year in 2021, she's going to get her 
her name on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. So deserving of it. So deserving of it. She's going to get that on her birthday. She deserves it. She star. deserves it. Hollywood. She did more. And that's why I said people didn't know that she, they just thought she played, you know, Florence or whatever, but she did more for that show than just play characters. She actually helped representation and to make sure that, you know, we're being portrayed correctly. And so I think that uh, with the McHenry trial uh, and you writing it and producing, having everything to do with it, you're making sure that we're represented accurately because the sub subtitle is uh, about the hoodie because people can judge us based off of what they see versus, you know, and think that, you know, with this kid, like we've seen courtroom dramas before, but we've never seen one with the kid. <laughs> yes. yes. And, and that's the, so and, and I have to go back and you're gonna hear me talk about certain people like Miss Molly Gibbs and all of them. It's because um Brandon and Aaron, I am who I am because they believed in me. I am who I am because they've been the chiefs in the village and they watched over their children. And I'm one of those children. So I do what I do because they taught me to give back. And what Miss Gibbs, you know, Miss Gibbs used to have this here um, Crossroads Arts Academy that was founded by her daughter, Angela Gibbs. And um, it gave some of us Blacks in the community a chance to go in and take acting workshops in the community and I could not afford it. But Ms. Gibbs let me come in and take the class. And, you know, but on the back end of that, when I made it, hey, she said, gotta pay for those classes. <laughs> and so, and that's the way it should be. She, I will never forget something she said, if you take something from a place, put it back. Well, she gave me some knowledge in the community, and so I'm trying to give it back. Ready? Well put. I actually, uh, since you said you wanted to give back to people, um, if there was a young artist that approached you for some wisdom of your experiences in Hollywood, what would you tell them? You cannot give up. You don't give up. And there's not a hurdle that's too high to jump. And if it's too high to jump, go around it. Yeah. But you cannot give up. You, you, you cannot give up. The walk may be long to go around it, but you get around it. And what you're going to learn on the way, you can't write. You can't imagine. And know that whatever you do, God is there with you. Yeah. God is there with you. You know, I don't know what faith you or anybody else, but there is something called faith. But the one thing that I do say is when someone loves you and they want to give you something, you embrace it and you accept it. Never underestimate the power of karma. It will come back. Amen. Amen. Um, my my final thoughts for you. Well, what's gonna ask you? Can you tell the people where we can find uh, the trailer and what we can do to help support the McHenry trial? I need. Um, I don't need money. I, I I need you to use your finger and go to YouTube and look up the McHenry trial trailer. It's one minute and 59 seconds. Watch it, like it, and write a comment. And tell your friends to do it. Tell your friends to tell their friends to do it. And help this go viral. And you see, the point is, if we don't show, and when I say we, I mean everybody race any race if we don't show that we want to see something positive hollywood or the people who are making the movies don't have no reason because it's not black it's not white it's green yeah it's green. well put well put 
It's all about the money. So, you know, it's all about the money, you know. And so, if please, if you can help me, go to YouTube, look for the McHenry trial trailer. On Ken Sagos. It's, like it. it's on it's on his website. It's on his YouTube channel, Ken Sagos. Yes. You see the McHenry trial trailer. Click on it, watch it, like it, review, uh, put comments, share it, tell others to do the same. Yeah, and I love you all for going to Facebook, and I love you for writing your messages on Facebook. But Facebook can't help me now. YouTube can help me right now. Go to YouTube. I, that's 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 what I need. What I'll do is I'll make sure I link the uh, link the trailer for your page in the description of this podcast episode so people can just look down in the comments, find it, click it, go to it, and do what Mr. Sagos tells you to do. <laughs> or you gotta be Kincaid. Before we go, does that mean you're getting rid of me now? That's what we're trying to do. No, no, no. Uh-uh. No. You're hey. Trying to say, you're, trying Ken, to say, you're trying to say this is over? I no, got no. it. No, Ken, hey, you done introduce yourself to me. You're in, I'm in your life now, buddy. I'm not going nowhere. <laughs> Uh, I appreciate you. We appreciate you. Brandon, yeah. anything you want to say to him? Uh, I will ask you one last question, just because I was such a big fan of his when he was around. Uh, what was it like if you, I don't remember if you had any scenes with him, but if you did, what was it like working with Corey Haim on the Backlot Murders? <laughs> That's a deep, a deep one right there. <laughs> you saw that? I did. I, I saw <laughs> Uh, um, but I had a uh, we was we was on a set the same day, yeah. and we we talked, and it was a wonderful conversation. So uh, he was an admirer of uh, Nightmare on the Other Street, and so we talked about Ken Cade and Freddie and all that. So yeah, it was. That's awesome. It really is. Where well, you go? I, I know you didn't ask, but I also met Alfred Chitcock. <gasps> I didn't know that. See, I'm a huge. I could show you right now. I have an Alfred <laughs> Hitchcock collection of movies. My favorite Alfred Hitchcock movie is actually Rope. Is my favorite movie of Alfred Hitchcock because uh, it's just it's, he wanted it to be one continuous shot, but back then they couldn't do it, so he had to add, had the edits, had the cuts. But he did it in a way that was just so marvelous. But I'm a huge Hitchcock fan. Uh, I know you also worked with Clooney before. Uh, so you've been all over the place. There's, there's not many people you ain't been in many movies with. And shows. How many? It's many I want to work with. I, you know, I, I have this dream to work with um, Cecily Tyson, um, Samuel L. Jackson. It's a lot of my day I want to be able to work with. So I, 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 I'm praying that maybe if my this writing take off, I don't work with you in front of the camera. I can work with you behind the camera. And, and something else, I, I, I continue to give scholarships to young people. So far, I've given over 500 scholarships. I'm going to be giving out 11 this weekend um, scholarships. And, um, and I enjoy doing it, you know. I'm not a rich man financially, but I hope to be pretty wealthy for my heart. And that comes from people who've been in my life. I've had a lot of cheerleaders on the sideline that's pushing me on. So, you know, and I like to believe that if the Heavenly Father, good Lord, says time to come home, I would like to be able to say that I was trying to make a difference when he called. Amen. He'll say, God will. He'll say, well done, my good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. Come, I'll make you rule over many. So, I hope you don't open that book too much now. Cause <laughs> see some other shit I did. So. <laughs> <laughs> so, I don't want nobody to see this and say, oh, he's such an angel. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. <laughs> yeah, I understand. No, we, hey, all of us, man, fall short, but uh, I'm thankful, man, just to be able to just spend some time with you and uh, talk to you and learn from you. And uh, Brandon actually, he didn't he didn't mention it, but we both write, um, and he he currently is writing more than I am because I'm I procrastinate and that's my problem. But 
but and he also acts so well. So he, we we're just happy just to just be in your presence, man. You know, yeah. I'm I'm gonna say this because I say this all the time is that whoever I am, or whoever you feel that I am, I am who I am because of you. So it's not that I should be honored to be, you should be honored to be in my presence. I think because you're part of making me who I am, I have to say I'm honored to be in your presence. Thank you. And I say this to all the fans. I really am, you know, so, and I appreciate that. I, I, I appreciate all the wind that you put under me so I can fly a little higher. I really appreciate it. And, you know, I love what I do. I love what I'm trying to do, and I love what I'm hoping to do. But most importantly, I love what I'm doing. And I'm not going to stop. So that's, the, that's what I can give to young people. I'm not going to stop. And when you do something, when you do something that you know you shouldn't have done, make it right. Make it right. You can easily walk on a solid ground with your head up, or you can walk with your head up, but walking in mud. That's nicely That's, put. Man, you should, hey, your next thing need to be putting a book of like quotes. Like, <laughs> no. No. No, you can see people walking all this here, but they're walking in mud. Mm. They're walking in mud. Yeah. But it really is a pleasure to interview you. I mean, I never thought I would interview Kincaid from Nightmare on Elm Street Part 3. I never, in my wildest dreams, thought. So it is. And let's do this again. We will. Yeah, I got you word on that. All right. You got my word. Yeah, absolutely. All right. All right. All right. So let's, let's make sure you let my fans know about this. All right. We will. Thank you. All right, I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay.